Okay. Um, so let's begin, and uh, I wish you all uh, uh, you very much welcome to this uh, press conference, uh, the first one of today, I suppose, um, which is uh, covering two very relevant and important topics uh, related to climate change and also involves the launching of two publications. Uh, this is a, a, a press conference uh, pulled together by the Etc. group, uh, Diana here and Silvia, Diana Bronson, Silvia Ribeiro represents, Ribeiro represents the Etc. group, and myself, uh, my name is Niklas Hellström, I'm working with the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. And we have uh, indeed, in fact, uh, published uh, the report that Diana will uh, be presenting and briefing you on, uh, which is uh, going to be the first uh, uh, presentation, uh, and that is a report covering the issue of geoengineering. And then Silvia will be uh, presenting and briefing you uh, on another publication, which is the Etc. Group publication, uh, which is called Who Will Feed Us? Questions for Food and Climate Change. So we're doing two things here, and we will begin with uh, Diana, who will uh, give you uh, the essence of this very, very uh, challenging, uh, thought-provoking, and uh, very uh, relevant publication on an issue very few have been thinking about, but which will be uh, hitting us and has already started to hit us, uh, and uh, that is the whole issue of new technologies and geoengineering and the risks involved in that. So, uh, Diana, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Nicholas, and thank you very much to the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation for commissioning and publishing uh, this report, which we intend to offer as a contribution to the emerging international debate around uh, geoengineering, which is the intentional large-scale manipulation of the climate system. Um, you may all wonder what that has to do with the negotiations going on in the Bella Center. Um, and it, while it is not a direct subject of the negotiations, uh, it's very much implicit in the debates around technology. Um, we have thought for some time at the Etc. group that uh, technology be, technol a technology agreement would be one of the major outcomes um, of this meeting, and certainly at the beginning of the second week of negotiations, it looks like that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, it, it, it contains a number of dangers, the current text on technology. Notably, there is uh, no mention of precaution, and there is no means of assessing the technologies that will receive uh, massive financial and institutional support out of the uh, structures that will be created in this meeting. Um, the most dangerous climate-related technologies, in our view, are those technologies which fit into the category of geoengineering. And this publication is um, a critical overview uh, of some of those technologies, and um, it raises a series of questions uh, about how negotiators, uh, governments, and civil society should be uh, looking at these technologies and what kind of governance arrangements uh, we need to begin to consider. Um, I'd like to, um, to speak a little bit to, um, to, to a couple of these technologies. You'll see there's a quite a complete overview of them within the paper. Um, generally, we divide them into three different categories. The first category would be what's known as solar radiation management. The second category would be carbon dioxide removal and sequestration. And the third category is weather modification. And we look at uh, each of these categories of technologies and some of the problems uh, in this publication that we're launching this morning. Um, there's three short case studies in the publication. Ocean fertilization would be one of the uh, technologies would, which would fit into the carbon dioxide removal and sequestration. The idea is simply that you dump 
iron particles into the ocean in order to stimulate the growth of phytoplankton, uh, which are algae, which will absorb carbon dioxide theoretically and then sink to the bottom of the sea. Uh, this creates uh, enormous dangers for the integrity of marine ecosystems, for the uh, uh, food chain in the ocean, um, um, for the, the li livelihoods of uh, fisher, fisher folk around the world, and for many other um, aspects which you can read about in the report. Um, of course, we do have here uh, in, in the Bella Center, we have firms that are interested in ocean fertilization and in obtaining carbon credits for fertilizing the ocean for an unproven technology to sequester uh, carbon that could be devastating to marine ecosystems. A second category is what we call in the report artificial volcanoes or shooting uh, sulfate uh, into the stratosphere, and that may sound like complete science fiction, but in fact it is receiving relatively serious consideration from um, very highly placed officials, just to cite one example, Steve Koonin, who is the Under Secretary of State in the Department of Energy of the United States of America, um, chaired a group of 10 men who studied the technical feasibility of shooting sulfates into the stratosphere and published a report uh, last summer on this topic um, by an institution called Novim in California, which pretends to offer um, scientific, neutral scientific assessments. Of course, shooting sulfates into the stratosphere, the idea is that these particles would reflect a portion of the sunlight back into outer space. Some of the side effects would be causing drought uh, in equatorial regions, notably in Central Africa, just as happened after the 1991 uh, natural volcano Pinatubo in the Philippines. It brought the temperatures down and it caused drought, and there are very unequal regional effects of these technologies, and the possibility of them being used in a unilateral fashion uh, we find uh, absolutely unacceptable, if not to say terrifying. We also look at the technology of cloud whitening, and I'll let you refer to that in the report so as not to take too much time. One of the things that's in the report that has not been looked at before is the whole question of intellectual property. And of course, while many of the proponents of geoengineering say that we are doing this as an emergency plan B, um, that we are just pursuing scientific research, uh, in fact, what we have is a number of individuals and corporations that are placing patent claims on these uh, technologies um, and are developing them purely in order to own those, those, those claims. And if you can contemplate for, the mo for a moment the notion that we would have a geoengineering technology that could uh, um, in any way uh, mitigate global warming, which is a doubtful notion, but the notion that that could be privately owned by an individual or a corporation or a single state or privately deployed, uh, we find absolutely terrifying. And the, the, the list of patent claims that you will find in the report uh, just gives a small sample of, of, of some of the dangers that would be involved. Finally, I'd, I'd just like to draw your attention to the end of the report where we have recommendations uh, for governments. We're here to alert negotiators in this building that they may be agreeing to something that they don't fully understand. Um, the, the texts that are currently on the table and technology and the possibility of having a new technology institution with intense private sector collaboration embedded into its very mandate um, and a series of mechanisms to enhance and accelerate the deployment of technology around the world with no assessment of the social and environmental uh, implications of those technologies is, uh, would be a very serious and potentially devastating outcome um, for the climate. So there's a series of recommendations which, um, as you know, the, the, um, 
The debate here is now evolving very rapidly, and this report is, is written some, some, some months ago, but we still believe that there should be an exclusion for geoengineering technology